question. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Sadi. Um, hi, uh, I'm Pradeep from the anesthetic and pain consultants at uh, University Hospital of North Midlands. Um, thanks, Sadiq, for this uh, uh, opportunity for giving uh, the talk. Can you see me, actually? Yes, I can. I can. I can't see you, but okay, I, can yeah. see, I can see the presentation. You know, everybody can see the presentation. So should we... Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Um, so basically, uh, we'll be seeing the significance of pain assessment, why to assess the pain, uh, structured pain assessment that we normally use in our day-to-day -day practice in terms of acute pain as well as chronic pain. Um, differentiate between nociceptive and neuropathic pain, although uh, I suppose uh, this one would be covered with respect to the neuropathic pain by uh, Manish in the, in the later talk. Uh, we'll also see some pain assessment tools in the clinical practice uh, in normal day-to-day -day population and in the special population as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You see my slides. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is an extreme example when a man uh, killed himself for his dental pain. But what was notable in that example was uh, that uh, the system had actually failed to assess his pain. And as a result, they couldn't manage the pain appropriately. The point here is uh, we need to be able to assess the pain appropriately uh, for uh, optimizing the management of the pain. Uh, assessment is the key. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, next slide, please. What is pain? Um, the ISP defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Uh, we, we know this definition and uh, we've seen this proposed new definition that was proposed in 2019, uh, which was open for consultation. This hasn't been officially accepted yet. Um, so basically, uh, we'll see some challenges in the pain assessment. Uh, obviously, uh, the patient needs to be articulative enough to be able to give us an idea as to how and where the pain is. Certain external factors that are beyond our control, like temperature, weather, they affect the pain as well. On top of that, there are usual challenges to the assessment of the pain. Firstly, there's no objective measure of the pain. Uh, secondly, as we all know, that pain is a sensory and emotional experience. By the nature of it, it's a complex, multidimensional and subjective uh, in nature, and it can present uh, in both physical as well as behavioral manner. The behavior of the patient changes, and it's very difficult to judge or assess the, patient, uh, the patient's pain appropriately, unless and until it's straightforward, you know, acute post operative pain, which is relatively easy to assess. Uh, pain states, chronic pain states are usually very tricky to assess. And moreover, uh, I'm sure my pain clinic uh, colleagues will agree with me that the amount of pain does not always correlate to the actual tissue damage. For example, in the back pain, we've always seen the patients that are complaining such, so, so much of back pain, but um, uh, there's, there's hardly any tissue damage in, in uh, their MRI scans. Now, there are certain objective, uh, there are certain tests that can try and objectify these, uh, this pain uh, issue in the form of functional MRI and uh, PET scan uh, brain activation that, you know, lit the, uh, uh, the, the painful part uh, of the, the body that is represented in the brain. But, uh, I mean, how many times have you seen a functional MRI uh, and PET scan uh, related to this pain activation uh, scan being done in, in practice? Hardly any time. Other specialized tests like quantitative sensory testing are uh, used in specialized and research settings only. So again, uh, the quantification of pain be does become uh, an issue. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, what's the objective of evalu evaluation of the pain? Obviously, pain is fifth vital sign. Uh, with the purpose of, uh, you know, the, 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 the purpose of assessment being the pain severity uh, is sort of used as a guide to, uh, you know, guide our treatment. And obviously, uh, in many uh, obvious cases in perioperative pain, 
issues, the cause of the pain can be ascertained if you assess the pain appropriately. Next slide, please. Right, so coming to the assessment as such, <clears throat> so we need to know the characteristics of pain uh, and that can be sort of uh, short formed or acronymed in, uh, in, in the manner of Socrates. I'm, so, uh, I'm sure a few of you would have been uh, aware of this uh, short form Socrates, that is sight, onset, character of pain, radiation of pain, associated symptoms, time, duration, exacerbating or relieving factors, and uh, severity, which are uh, probably self-explanatory. It's, it's an easy acronym to remember when uh, sitting in a pain clinic if, if you're tr trying to uh, see, uh, assess the pain. Um, the other bit is uh, their impact on social life, marital life, sleep, uh, and then you need to know their medical and surgical history as well. You do need to rule out some red flags in the treatment of uh, uh, while, while assessing the pain so that they can be addressed appropriately. Um, Sorry, sorry, can I go to previous slide, please? Yeah, so coming to the treatment history, we need to know the effectiveness and uh, adverse effects from the previous treatments that the patient has already had. Um, psychology, obviously, is much more important in acute pain as compared to the chronic pain, as uh, we're all aware of. We do need to rule out the yellow flags or the factors that may indicate the potential for uh, ongoing disability in the patients with pain. So like, for example, uh, situations like anxiety, depression, behaviors like catastrophization, you know, expectation that only passive treatments will help. And there's a bit of reluctance to be involved in active participation. So these are all yellow flags that need to be highlighted and they need to be addressed in assessing the pain as well. Similarly, the psychosocial situation of the patient have they got any family support or do they not have family support? So I'm sure uh, you'd have come across the patients, young patients uh, who, have, who have chronic pain issues and who have got the family members suffering with similar pain issues. That's not an uncommon situation to be in. And uh, obviously, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 an abundant family support does help you know, in management of pain as well. Now, whilst the process of assessment goes on, you do need to differentiate if it's not susceptible or neuropathic pain. Um, there are some strong verbal descriptors of both. So listen to the patient, listening pain or, you know, localized pain is characteristic of nociceptive pain, which is somatic in nature, whereas dull pain, uh, it might be nociceptive, but visceral in nature. Similarly, there are some verbal descriptors like uh, for example, uh, tingling pain, numbness, you know, lancinating pain, stabbing kind of pain, they are indicative of neuropathic pain. Now, what do you look for in neuropathic pain as signs? You're looking for a presence of allodynia, hyperalgesia, or hypoalgesia. So allodynia is, as you all uh, aware, non-painful stimulus causing exaggerated painful uh, response. Uh, hyperalgesia is any painful stimulus that causes greatly increased pain response and hypoalgesia is decreased perception of pain uh, which is caused by noxious stimulus. So these are all characteristic signs of neuropathic pain which we'll be seeing in detail in the next talk. So from the examination point of view, obviously we need to assess the general... Pradeep, we can't hear you properly. Pradeep. From that, you need to see uh, what uh, their gait. They are they are they taking any walking aids? Um, uh, are they able to? Right. Hello. Can you hear me now? We can, hear, we can hear you. There was a bit of delay. Go on. Hello. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Hello. We can hear you, Pradeep. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, lovely. Excellent. Um, so other than that, we need to assess the general mood uh, and any further site specific examination in terms of inspection, palpation. You know, you look for the color changes, trophic changes, uh, hair loss uh, in the painful area or any scar tissue where the pain is. Uh, in palpation, uh, you, you feel for the tenderness. Is there any swelling, uh, any sort of temperature change, any uh, allodynia, hyperalgesia? 
And obviously, if there's a patient of uh, back or neck pain, you need to do a proper neurological examination of the patient. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, obviously, there are changes uh, physically occurring in in terms of uh, in terms of when the, when the patient is experiencing pain. So these can be uh, either you know physiological sign changes or physical changes or any uh, obviously uh, visual changes uh, that we uh, that we can see in terms of physiological signs. Uh, we uh, we day to day practice we see that the patients have increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, their respiratory rate has gone up. They can have some signs like nausea, pallor, sweating, pupillary dilatation. Their muscle tones might be increased. Um, in terms of uh, physical signs, you might see changes in the temperature, color, muscle wasting, and uh, muscle spasm, which is site-specific. Say, for example, in complex regional pain syndrome, these signs are very obvious, whereas in other uh, pain conditions, these signs may not be that obvious. Um, certain, uh, certain, uh, certain situations where you feel that the, if the facial expressions are changed, there are emotional changes that you can appreciate in the patient. And uh, obviously a distant patient can, uh, you know, can indicate that you know, the patient uh, is, is in serious, severe pain. Uh, specific tests can also be done to assess pain, for example, in abdomen, chronic abdominal pain to differentiate if it is coming from the abdominal wall or from the abdominal viscera. You can do a, a sign called a Scarnet's sign, uh, when you give pressure and uh, pressure over the abdominal wall, and you ask the muscle to sort of taut their muscles of the of the abdomen. And if the Carnet sign is positive, then it's likely that the pain is coming from the abdominal wall. Whereas if it is negative, it might be coming from the viscera. Similarly, you need to assess the range of movements, uh, uh, active as well as passive as well. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, after this, we'll be coming to some of the assessment tools that we use in pain medicine. So uh, as we are all aware of some unidimensional pain scales, I'm sure we all use it in our day-to-day -day practice. There are other pain scales like multidimensional pain scales that we more often used in chronic pain situations. And there are some diagnostic pain scales, which are mainly used for uh, assessing uh, neuropathic versus nociceptive pain. Next slide, please. So there's a bit of uh, jam-packed information here with regards to the pain scales, but uh, you don't need to memorize each and every pain scales, but just as long as you remember that there are pain scales related to most of the situations that are not simple or straightforward. So there are specialized pain scales for uh, the elderly, for dementia patients, for pediatric population. As long as you're aware of this concept, that is fine, okay? So uh, coming to the unidimensional pain scales, um, so they are uh, basically uh, simple self-reporting pain scales, and they're the ones that are most commonly used. Uh, mainly used to assess the acute pain uh, in terms of uh, assessing their severity or intensity. I'm sure we are all aware of verbal rating scale, visual or neurox scale, and numerical rating scale. Now, one important thing to remember is these are categorical rating scales. So, <laughs> this, this is a pain data, so it's not uh, like normally distributed data on a Gaussian curve. So if you need to analyze from a statistical point of view, you need to uh, put, in, uh, put in practice for the non-parametric tests rather than parametric tests of analysis. Thank you. Next slide, please. Next slide, Sadi. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so this is how a visual analog scale looks like. Uh, it's a 10 centimeter line. It's an unmarked scale except at its ends with one end being no pain and the other end being severe pain. Um, so it's helpful in the language difficulty uh, situations. Uh, patient just places a mark on this uh, scale basically to express their uh, pain. Next slide, please. Similarly, this is a numerical rating scale or NRS. Uh, so it can be from zero to 10 or zero to 100. It's simple, quick, uh, commonly uh, used pain. Uh, it's uh, so basically uh, a patient points a finger where, where their pain is. It's, it's self-explanatory. 
Um, now, extremes of age, pre-verbal children, uh, those who have auditory or visual impairment or have any cognitive dysfunction, unfortunately, cannot use these unidimensional pain rating scales. Uh, third scale, which we probably, uh, which the nurses use it more commonly, is verbal rating scale. Uh, which is obviously a descriptive uh, rating scale from zero to four with uh, none, mild, moderate, severe, and excruciating uh, pain in uh, there. Uh, it does produce some non-continuous uh, uh, data. So statistically, uh, if you are strictly speaking, this verbal rating scale gives a weaker result as compared to the visual uh, analog scales. Now, what do you do for children? Um, and for the learning disabled and uh, for patients with poor language skills. So there comes the picture scales. Next slide, please. So for children, what we commonly use is one basic scale. I'm sure many of you would be aware of this basic scale, but other than that, there are a couple more scales which are not commonly used, but that can be used as well. So uh, they are, uh, you know, pieces of hurt scale, and there's 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 something called as flax scale. So flax stands for, uh, you know, uh, the uh, facial expressions, the uh, the limb act, uh, limb movement activity, cry and consolability scale. So this is useful for uh, children uh, from two months onwards to up to eight years, and they can also be it can also be used for nonverbal children, basically. So anyway, coming to the commonly used uh, scale, uh, the first is Wong Baker Faces Scale, uh, which is commonly used in children about three years. Uh, now, they are asked to point on the face at this point of time, basically. It's worst on the right hand side. So children can easily point to finger. Uh, at which which of their uh, which of the face they are feeling like the second is pieces of hurt scale it's ba it's basically four similar pieces that are given to the kids and that can be used for uh, you know uh, uh, quantifying the pain like it doesn't have to be this this uh, this these pieces as i've shown it can be you know four toy pizza pieces so lots of children have a toy pizza as well, so they can they, you can ask to quantify how many pieces of pain you have, and uh, surprisingly, it 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 does it is a validated tool, and it does produce con statistically significant consistent results uh, in in uh, sort of long term pain conditions as well. Next slide, please. Yeah. So now we'll come to the multi dimensional pain scale. All right, will be finished. Um. So. These are used to assess chronic pain usually, although there is a, a multidimensional pain scale called Kappa, uh, which, which can be used for acute pain as well. So these are mainly used to assess the severity of the pain. And secondly, more importantly, it's used to assess its impact on life as such. So basically, it's a set of questionnaire that the patient has to answer in terms of how their daily activities are affected. So that is scored, and that gives you an indication of the examples are a brief pain inventory or its short form, and the second example can be Magal pain questionnaire as well. Adi, could you try? Can you hear me? But you, could you just check your connection because you're you're cutting off uh, quite frequently. Right. I think it sounds near, like you're uh, assessing uh, nearly death nearly rather than life. He's nearly finished. I'm 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 sitting in a clinic on on third floor, so it is ah, it is as God. as good as okay. it's going to it's be. Okay. Not to worry. Not in the morgue. That. Okay, that's fine. You've nearly finished anyway. I think. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Um, Although I've kept my teetered my mobile phone near the window anyway, um, so coming to the diagnostic questionnaires, these are the complex questionnaires which are mainly used to distinguish from uh, neuropathic pain from the nociceptive pain. Um, they're generally completed with the help of clinician who is assessing the pain, 
Um, there are some examples of this. The, the thing which is commonly used in the UK is Lance questionnaire, that is Leeds Assessment of Neuropathic Symptoms and Signs, in which you got five pain-related questions and two clinical signs. Uh, and if the, pain, if the score is 12 or more, then that is indicative uh, of uh, a possibility of underlying neuropathic pain. Uh, similarly, in France, they use DN4 questionnaire, and there's a, there's a questionnaire called Pain Detect as well, which is uh, commonly used in Germany. Next slide, please. So, uh, in some situations wherein you might not be able to communicate with the patients appropriately, there are pain scales specially designed for nonverbal patients, which are Abbey pain scales uh, that is used in dementia. There's a pain scale called pain ad, that is pain assessment of advanced dementia scale. And uh, there's a comfort pain scale, which uh, can be used in pediatric population as well as adult population as well. So to revisit the objectives, we have seen the significance of pain assessment. And um, we've seen the structured pain assessment. Uh, we've sort of learned to differentiate between nociceptive and neuropathic pain. We've seen the commonly used pain tools in the clinical practice, as well as some pain tools, uh, familiarization in specialized population. And um, now remember that there are a lot of factors that affect the assessment of pain, and you do need to consider those. So say for example, children are sort of prompt in expressing their pain versus elderly people might hide their pain. Similarly, cultural or religious beliefs have uh, some sort of bearing on the expression of pain as well. There are gender differences in pain uh, perception as well. Um, so all these factors do need to be taken into account before uh, you know, uh, trying to assess the pain. Uh, thank you. Any questions, please? Right, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Pradeep. Uh, that was an excellent run. Oh, with sorry for the connection.